Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, our Competition 21 launch event. Uh, this is a really exciting time again for us to launch this competition, um, particularly aiming at supporting mature innovation. Um, and that's following the phase three pilot that, that we started um, last year. So I'm Fanny Burroughs, I'm leading on the SBI Healthcare Program. And I'm really pleased to be here today, um, welcoming some great speakers and share more information with you about this new funding opportunity. Um, we also have a wonderful programs management office team in the background supporting the event um, and responding to your question with Alice, our events manager. And we also have um, Z, Amy, um, Randa and Antonio that will provide you more information throughout this session um, and responding to, to your questions. So thank you for all of you for, for joining us today. Um, we're recording this session to, to make it available together with the slides um, and the information presented so everybody will be able to access this after the event. Um, and you'll also have an opportunity to ask questions to our speakers during the session um, and you can use the Q&A box for this um, and we'll answer some of your questions directly uh, in the Q&A box and some of them live as well. Lots of information is available on our website. You can find uh, the challenge brief for this competition, um, some information particularly about this challenge on respiratory diseases uh, and the prevention of cardiovascular disease, um, and also lots of guidance for, for prospective applicants. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, today, um, this is the agenda. This is what we've got planned for, for this session. Um, and I'm joined by some um, really good speakers um, and, and we look forward to, to having some insights about this competition and the challenge that, that um, we're launching today. Um, and we also hear um, about the support that is available from, from the Academic Health Science Network. Um, so we'll have our joint uh, program director, uh, Mike Lewis, if we can perhaps go back to the agenda, please. Um, so Mike Lewis um, is here today to give us some information about the program and, and more particularly about this competition. Um, and we'll also have the pleasure to hear from uh, Professor Najib Rahman, uh, Professor of Respiratory Medicine, and also Professor Brian Ferenc, uh, that is Professor and Director of Research in Translational Therapeutics. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session with, with Professor Rahman and Professor Ferenc afterwards. Um, and then we'll have um, Des Holden that they'll come and talk to us about the HSN network and the support that they can provide um, to innovators. Um, we'll have Z as well from the Program Management Office that'll talk to us about um, the assessment um, of this uh, competition and actually how to go through the application process. Um, and we'll also have Q&A session about um, the HSN, about the, the competition, um, application process and assessment. So, so you'll be able to, to ask your questions throughout um, this session. Um, just a quick note on housekeeping, if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, if you do have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box um, of this Zoom meeting and we'll answer to you either in writing or we'll ask those questions live during, during the Q&A session. Uh, as I mentioned before, we'll upload the slides and we, a recording of the session and that'll be put directly on my website for you to access um, whenever you like. Um, and you'll also find lots of information uh, on our website um, and particularly would like to draw your attention um, to the challenge brief that really sets out the scene of, of what we're looking for uh, for this competition and also uh, further guidance. Um, but now moving on to the next slide, please, um, and, and without delaying anything further, um, I'd like to move on to our first speaker, uh, and I'd like to introduce you to Professor Mike Lewis. Um, so Mike Lewis is um, our joint director for the NIHR, I4I and SBRA healthcare programs. Um, and that's the industry focused research arms of, of the NHR and, and of NHS England and NHS improvements, respectively. So, Mike is a professor of life science innovation at the University of Birmingham. Um, and he has an extensive industrial background uh, in life sciences and digital innovation in healthcare. Uh, and he's previously held senior roles at multinational companies. Um, he's worked for numerous private equity and venture capital organizations, and he's also chair of uh, three life science companies and also sits on the board of SNOMED, um, the, the, the global medical coding um, standardization system. Um, and Mike is also executive on the executive board of, of Birmingham Health Partners. Um, so Mike, welcome to this launch event and thank you for coming to, to talk to us about the program and the competition uh, and over to you now. Thank you, Fanny. I always enjoy the SBRI programs, especially as, a, as I was a chair of the panels many years ago. So it's good. Next slide, please. 
So let's talk about SBRI Healthcare. And this is your, your sort of 10 minute primer on SBRI Healthcare as a, as a competition. SBRI Healthcare is a, it's a structured process and, it, and it's there to enable potential innovative suppliers to engage with the NHS and public sector, you need to go back one, thanks, uh, and to get funded for it. It is supported primarily by two areas, the Accelerated Access Collaborative, which is the AAC program, and it's also supported by the AHSN network, the Academic Health Science Network as well. And they're the primary drivers behind what we do at the SBRI program. And if you look at the four boxes, we're trying to improve patient care, improve efficiency, allow innovators to access the NHS. And then one of the other aims as well is we'd like to increase the wealth of the nation in the UK because wealth undoubtedly drives health. Next slide, please. Great. There's a lot of funding out there. and um, certainly working with things like the Biomedical Catalyst and the i for i program, it's, it's difficult sometimes to find out which bit of funding does which thing. So if you look down on your, your chart here, you can see in the blue SBRI phase one, SBRI phase two. And today we're talking about SBRI phase three. And you can see how this clearly sits into the implementation side. So um, phase one and phase two we'll talk about in a second, but phase three is all about implementation. This is a program that we uh, tested out last year, our very first phase three pilot. And our colleagues at NHS England were pleased with the results. It brought forward some really good innovations and some very helpful innovations. So they funded us now to go through and run some more sessions of phase three. It is, if you go back up one, somebody's heavy on the buttons there, thank you. Oh, oh how a few more. I'll go through to the one with the, the little rings around it so you can see the the funding. Can you go down one more? That's it, perfect. So in terms of funding, what sort of funding is it? It's 100% funding, unlike a lot of government grant type funding, where you have to make a contribution if you're an SME, this is 100% funded. So what you spend and what you justify, you will get by. It's the program as well that's very risk orientated. We want to fund lots of things which are potentially risky that ordinarily VC or seed funding, EIS funding wouldn't fund. So we want things which are risky, a little bit edgy. Uh, we said, um, said at the um, showcase we held last week that we, when you look at a spinning wheel, a spinning wheel, it goes fastest at the outside edge of it. And that's where the most risk is, but that's also where the most velocity is. And that's what we're trying to do with our, uh, our SBRI program. And once again, because it's supported by the AHSN network, you've got access to a great group of people and teams who can help support you through the journey. Okay, perfect, next slide, just so I was calling for it. So the SBRI, they're themed competitions. And you get a lot of programs, particularly things like I4I, which are ag theme agnostic, but what we do with SBRI, we pick selected themes. A lot of our driver is the 20 plus five agenda that we have within the NHS, looking at the core 20 plus five and trying to work out competitions which talk about some unmet need. This competition as well is really suitable for SMEs. Obviously, if you're a bigger business, you can apply, but it's really targeted at the SMEs and it's something which is ideal for them because of the size of funding we offer. Go back, thank you. Um, it's also aimed as well, not just at SMEs, you can get charities applying for it, you could get local authorities applying for it, any, um, and you can get uh, all sorts of providers from primary care, secondary care, looking at this. And uniquely about this program, you can be based anywhere in Europe if you want to apply. We talked about the different phases. Phase one and phase two were the early starts for the SBRI program. And phase one was a feasibility project where you did six months, proved some theses out, got hundred thousand pounds to do it. And if you're successful, that allows you to apply for phase two where you could get up to 800,000 pounds. Phase three is different. It's, you don't have to go through phase one and phase two to get to phase three. It is a standalone item by itself. And it is there purely to help you gather the real world evidence an implementation, understanding how you scale a thing so that you can then get the evidence needed to go through and get funding and get commissioned. Next slide, please. So in detail, phase three. There's a couple of key words here I, I pull out. On the first line, I pull out the word mature because we want to develop uh, mature products. And the second word I look at is clinical settings. So what we want, you, we want to fund is we want things which are through that development stage but they are mature products right at the point of being able to commercialize if only they could gather the evidence to, to prove to commissioners this is a good solution. We want you to gather the real world evidence because undoubtedly in this 
purchasing world of ours, commissioners want to know that what, they, what they're buying works, but also what they're buying works and is cost effective as well. So we want you to develop tools. We want you to develop the evidence, gather the information that will help support you get uptake. And you can see that the phase three runs for 12 months. That's the maximum length of the project. We don't think you really would take longer than that to gather real world evidence. And then you can get to half a million pounds, which is net a project. So next slide, please. Let's talk about what it's suitable for and what it's not suitable for. In scope, medical devices, digital health and equipment, behavioral interventions, things which look at new models of care. What's not in there are drugs and therapeutics. What we're after is mature innovations. Go back up one. If we're after mature innovations, we're not after innovations which are early stage and looking to do lots of development work. We're not looking at basic research and early stage development. We are looking at implementation studies. So once again, it's about adoption and gathering the evidence. Next slide. If that's the place where you come into the funding and you got your half million pounds from us and you've developed, what do we expect to be the exit points? We, well, we want you to have an, execute, uh, an implementation plan. We want you to build a business case. We want you to have included EDI and, and made some assumptions as well about how sustainable this innovation is. We may, we may want you to develop your marketing and comms tools and your pricing tools. We may want you to have developed the scaling plan, which says what resources I need in which location. So they're the nine of the exit points, which you can mix and match. But when you're looking at the grant funding, it's always good if you determine what your exit point is so we can just, so we can look at your application and see whether, see what we're going to get at the end of funding. Next slide, please. Oh, I think you missed one in terms of challenges there. Uh, there's another slide. Um, there was one in there, phase three challenges. Okay, let me tell you, if the slide's not up on there, we're gonna be looking at two key areas today. And um, we've got, I've got a couple of my colleagues to help us. We're gonna be looking at respiratory disease, and we're also going to be looking at prevention of cardiovascular disease. That's the slide. So in respiratory, it's all about early diagnosis. And I, I, we're not too worried about adults or pediatrics, but what we want to do is improve our diagnostic capability. And we also want to look through and we need to work out mechanisms for triaging patients at high risk so they can be triaged into needing care or not needing care immediately. Second part of respiratory disease is how do we monitor and manage people? How do we stop people coming to real estate based care? How do we keep them out of the real estate where the, the, the waiting times in A&E are long? How do we make sure that the right people come into A&E? How do we make sure that people who've been through the system don't come back into the system and rebound? So there are two areas of respiratory. On the cardiovascular side is early detection of people who aren't symptomatic right now, but you would know that are going to go on to develop cardiovascular disease, or they're going to develop additional symptoms. So that's one area. We want you, if you've got innovations which will help the prevention agenda as well, because every dollar, you, every pound you spend on prevention saves you about six pounds later on in terms of healthcare costs. If you can help us improve prevention strategies in CVD, that's great, that's right in scope. And the last one is CVDs, are one of those conditions where you can, the patient can play some part in terms of their their outcomes and their health journey. So we were looking for innovations that can empower patients to either show up earlier or how they can manage their conditions um, and how we can target engagement towards them and patient activation so that they take an active role in, in their CVD and their prevention CVD. Okay, talk about dates and timing. Um, we, uh, here's a competition launch date, 14th of June. Uh, you know where we are today, we're at the 20th of June. You have to get your applications in by the 26th of July. So you've got around about five weeks to do it. And believe me, the form's not really, really complex. It's a fairly simple form. We go through uh, assessment um, and the assessment runs in September. I just look at my board and it looks like our assessments run uh, around about the week of the 12th of September. So that's when we're, we're having a look through and then we conduct panels if you're called up we run panels over three days, 18th, 19th, and 20th of October. So they're the dates when we have a panel of people who've assessed your application, they sit down and they, they review and ask you questions, get a chance to find out more details about your, your project. Contracts awarded, November. 
So that's a fairly tight timeline from competition opening in June to November, it's about five months. And then funding follows fairly quickly after, so you should be able to get started really early on in 2023 if you're a winner for the competition. So you're going to hear a lot more about, um, about uh, the competition and the areas later on, but let's just talk about the next slide, which is about whether, whether this competition and whether these grants work. So far uh, in the SBRI program, we supported 265 SMEs, ventures, innovators, entrepreneurs, and we've invested over 109 million pounds into these companies. So you can work out the average amount we, we invest. Don't forget phase one, we, we only invest 100,000, phase two is 800,000, phase three is half a million. But if you go to the next slide, you can see what did that 109 million do? We took 81 companies through to commercial success. Um, we got a lot of IP granted, 162 IP. The leverage, which is a figure in the middle of 360 million. So for every pound we put into SBRI grants, uh, the businesses, entrepreneurs were able to leverage another three and a half pounds of private money or external money. So it's a really good 3.5 to one payback ratio. We've also helped support, create nearly 2000 jobs. But the, the important thing for you, if you're, a, if you're a, one of the, an NHS insider, then I think the figure at the bottom and in the middle, we've had 7.2 million patients involved either through using the products which have come through SBRI or being involved in the trials of products or gathering of evidence of products, which is about 13% of the population, about one in six, one in seven of the population have actually, one in eight of the population in England have actually had some sort of SBRI funded intervention. So it's a really good, very uh, worthwhile set of grants that have impact. Um, and the other figure, I'm sure my colleagues at BASE would be very happy that 47 products out of the, the area we funded have actually gone through and been exported out to uh, countries outside the UK. So that's me. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about phase three, uh, the different challenges from the other people. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Fanny. That's great. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, that was a, a, a really good introduction and overview of, of the competition, about the programme. Um, you know, setting the scene of what what, um, what the competition is about and, and what our expectations are, what type of solutions we, we're looking for. Um, and, and we'll come back into more details about this because um, I would like to move on to our next speakers now. And, and I, what I would like to do is to introduce you to, to Professor Brian uh, Ferenc. Brian is, is Professor of Research in Translational Therapeutics and Executive Director of the Centre for uh, naturally, uh, naturally Randomised Trials at the University of Cambridge. He's also a visiting professor in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Milan in Italy. And prior to his current post in Cambridge, um, his previous position included Chief of Cardiology and Director of the Cardiovascular Genomic Research Center at Wayne State University School of Medicine in the US, um, but also Chief Medical and Scientific Officer for Public-Private Collaboration, working on the Chinese Precision Medicine Initiative in, in Beijing, um, and also CEO of a biotech company. Um, so welcome, Professor Ferenc. We're really grateful to have you on board today, um, and we really look forward to hearing your thoughts on the prevention of, of um, cardiovascular disease. Um, over to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank, uh, thank you all for joining us. Next slide, please. Over the next few minutes or so, what I'll do is I'll review the rationale for why we, uh, why we should focus on preventing cardiovascular disease as well as describe some of the areas of specific innovation that the competition is trying to um, encourage. Next slide, please. So as most of you probably are aware that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of both morbidity, mortality, and healthcare costs, not only in the UK, but also in the developing and in the developed world. Indeed, it's been estimated that as many as one in three um, uh, cardiovascular disease contributes to as many as one in three cardiovascular deaths in the UK and the US, and up to one half of all cardiovascular of all deaths in the developing world in certain parts of Eastern Europe. But what's important, however, is that there's a general consensus that some forms of cardiovascular disease, including atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease leading to heart attacks and strokes, as well as to hypertension, 
and some of the um, cardiometabolic diseases, including diabetes, that, that lead to atherosclerotic cardiovascular or risk increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, as well as heart failure, are completely preventable. And indeed, it is this notion that, that cardiovascular disease is, complete, is largely um, preventable that has caused the NHS long-term plan to identify cardiovascular disease as the single most significant area in which the NHS can save lives. And to that end, they have set a goal of preventing 150,000 heart attacks and strokes by, 20, uh, by 2030. And this program largely is involved with identifying persons uh, risk factors that are known to cause atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease early in the disease process, as well as identifying those people who have undiagnosed hypertension or elevated lipids or diabetes. And in addition to that, um, focusing on improving adherence to known effective therapies in those people who have established disease. The NHS long-term plan is being um, proactively audited by the CBD Prevent Project, and its most recent audit was just was published just a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Next slide, please. But in addition to the NHS long-term plan, the UK Life Sciences Industrial Strategy also has identified cardiovascular disease and early detention and prevention of cardiovascular disease as an extremely important area for innovation. Indeed, the Life Sciences Industrial Strategy has um, challenged the medical, the scientific, and the tech community to begin to think about how to innovate to transform our healthcare system from a sick care system that focuses on diagnosing and treating disease into a true healthcare system that begins to identify people earlier in the course of disease and begin to innovate new solutions to more effectively prevent that disease. The rationale being that not only could this strategy of identifying disease early much more effectively prevent disease and improve the public health, but it also has the potential to substantially improve uh, the, the efficiency of the biopharma industry, as well as to create entirely new industries in the proactive management of health and wellness uh, among citizens in the UK and throughout the rest of the world. Next slide, please. Informed by both the NHS's uh, long-term strategy and the UK Life Sciences Industrial Strategy, recently the NHS Health Check System was, was reviewed and was re reconfigured into an intelligent health check program that is designed really to be a, personalized, a platform for personalized health management longitudinally. And to that end, what the, goal, what the, the purpose of this program is is to measure person's risk factors in order to sort of much more effectively identify people at risk for disease early in the course of disease. And to, as part of that innovation strategy, new recommendations are for an earlier entry at age 30 as compared to age 40, with a, a new focus on longitudinal assessments of risk factors every three years on a fully digital platform in order to learn each person's individual health trajectories and identify the optimal time for intervening in order to most effectively prevent cardiovascular disease. And the rationale and the use case and the operational um, um, methods for deploying this strategy will be fully detailed later this summer with the publication of the Joint British Society's fourth um, uh, uh, consensus statement on the prevention of cardiovascular disease. And so together, these four pillars, the NHS long-term plan, the UK Life Sciences Industrial Strategy, the new Intelligent Health Check System, all brought together by the Joint British Society's fourth um, consensus statement on preventing cardiovascular disease, really established a prevention agenda for cardiovascular disease. There is at the core of that, the organizing principle that most cardiovascular diseases are completely preventable, but an equally a strong consensus has emerged that we don't prevent disease, uh, cardiovascular disease very well. Next slide, please. And it is this realization that we don't effectively prevent disease that has motivated this, um, this, the, this, this challenge for preventing cardiovascular disease. And in particular, the, the challenge seeks to encourage innovation, three, uh, three different categories of innovation. First, the program seeks to um, encourage innovation in early detection of people at high risk of disease. 
Specifically, it, it seeks to encourage innovation to synthesize evidence from multiple different sources, including traditional risk factors, genomics, other kinds of omics, bioinformatics, imaging, longitudinal healthcare within, uh, the, uh, within electronic medical records, in order not simply to identify people's risk in the short term, but over any time horizon, indeed to begin to identify people's trajectory of disease over time to identify those persons early in the course of disease who are most likely to benefit from early intervention to prevent disease. And it specifically challenges the innovation community to do this in a way that can develop tools or algorithms or tests that can be deployed in community diagnostic centers or in GP practices, but in a way that does not burden GP practices or the healthcare system with additional work by, for example, inviting GPs to become data scientists or having to um, employ data scientists, but rather to synthesize all of this information in a way that is intuitive and useful and can track people over time and then give that information back to the health system in a directly actionable way. Next slide, please. The second area of innovation that's being strongly encouraged is the identification of strategies to more effectively prevent disease, a cardiovascular disease and specifically methods that can estimate the benefit of specific actions in order to prevent disease. Where prevention, prediction of risk and estimation of benefit are complementary but completely different um, uh, pro uh, problems to solve in different use cases. The challenge here is that most, uh, the, the overall goal is to sort of identify the right, uh, develop a system that helps us identify the right um, patient have the right medicine for the right patient at the right time at the right dose. But the challenge for innovation is that most uh, evidence for benefit generally derives from randomized trials because it's the highest level of evidence that has the highest burden before we do something to a patient. We have to have be, be quite persuaded of the evidence. So the challenge would be to develop uh, long-term evidence for early intervention that uses either naturally randomized evidence or quasi-randomized evidence within uh, um, instrumental variables or other kinds of innovative approaches that can allow us to objectively estimate or objectively test the estimated benefits from different tools and different tests or algorithms. Next slide, please. And finally, the, the third category of innovation, innovation that's being strongly encouraged is perhaps the most important, and that is to put the citizen at the center of their own health care in order to empower them to manage their own health care trajectory and their own disease management in order to effectively prevent disease. The challenge here will be sorting out exactly how one can sort of incorporate longitudinal measurements over time that provide information back to the citizen that is both useful and intuitive and directly actionable, including helping guide them along the best choices for that individual person in order to most effectively reduce their exposure to the causes of disease and effectively prevent disease in a way that is both actionable but also intuitive and that rewards patients for engaging in their health and, um, uh, and for achieving their milestones in a way that can effectively help prevent disease. So these three categories of, of, of innovation are really meant to sort of completely transform how we can think about preventing cardiovascular disease in a much more proactive way to create a system that is both proactive, predictive, and preventive to effectively prevent cardiovascular disease. So with that, I'll stop and answer questions during the period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, really insightful um, overview of, of um, you know, the, 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 the general strategies around cardiovascular um, diseases and the prevention, but also what approaches could be deployed to prevent them and then a really strong overview of, of what we're looking for in terms of innovation for, for this competition. So thank you very much for, for this. Um, and, and any question for, for Brian around um, or surrounding this challenge, um, please put them in the Q&A box and, and we'll come back to it a, a little bit later. Um, but for now, what I would like to do is to introduce you to, to Professor Najib um, Rahman. And Naj, Naj is a consultant and senior lecturer in, in respiratory medicine at um, Oxford uh, respiratory trial units um, at the Newfield Department of Medicine, University of Oxford. 
was appointed director of Oxford Respiratory Trial Unit in, in 2012, and he leads the trial methodology and approval disease group at the trial unit. So NACH conducts a diverse portfolio of research um, in plural infection, undiagnosed plural effusion, malignant plural effusion, um, and, and so on, um, and, and imaging and intervention. So, so welcome, uh, Professor Raman. We really look forward to, to hearing about um, the challenges in the field of, of respiratory care. Um, and, and over to you, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, um, Fanny. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect, so I, I apologize everyone, I'm on um, a clinical stint and the uh, hospital Wi-Fi is not brilliant, so if I drop out, then that's the problem. Okay, so, um, I mean, SBRI approached me about this um, with my clinical trials hat on, with my respiratory clinicians hat on, and also because I'm deputy lead for respiratory research in the UK. So I'm just gonna give you some insights into respiratory disease. Um, I, I think it may be, interesting to contrast this to the cardiovascular agenda uh, because the respiratory agenda is really rather different. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, um, why respiratory? Well, it's an incredibly big healthcare burden. We think 20% of the UK population has a respiratory disease, and that's not really the half of it because we also know that the incidence of all respiratory disease is on the way up and that is unlike other diseases including cardiovascular disease and cancer which are either flat or reducing not only that but the hospital economic burden of respiratory disease is on the way up and we're seeing increasing admissions up to fivefold compared to 20 years ago for respiratory disease compared to other disease areas and this may mean that respiratory disease is becoming more common or um, more likely actually that other disease areas are doing better and respiratory has been kind of left behind. There's also a big issue with respiratory and one of the reasons in fact I became a respiratory physician is that a lot of our patients are the most deprived parts of society. So patients who are coal workers or smokers or have TB are often very left behind by uh, the healthcare system and the social system. And we do know that outcomes in respiratory are inversely associated to one's wealth and social abilities and therefore um, there is a big um, EDI agenda here as well. Now let me talk about what respiratory represents just so we're on the same page. It's a very broad speciality and, and most people when they think of respiratory think of smoking related lung disease or COPD, emphysema, whatever you want to call it, and the biggest category of respiratory disease in terms of prevalence, incidence and admission is the so-called airways disease, as I've put here, which is a combination of asthma and COPG. So I think it would be smart for people to focus on that, but I just want to make the very clear point that respiratory is much broader than that alone. And so I've listed a few of the breadth areas of respiratory here. So we deal with very acute problems, people who are literally dying of hypoxia or high CO2s, respiratory failure, acute respiratory infection, uh, acute pneumonia is possibly the most common cause of admission to any hospital in the UK, for example. We deal with chronic diseases over the life course of the patient, cystic fibrosis to bronchiectasis from age one to age 90. We deal with long-term problems such as obstructive sleep apnea that affects 4% of the UK population, causes damage to driving ability, working ability, social life, and then some things which descend much more quickly, such as interstitial lung disease that leave people breathless and hypoxic for the rest of their life. Excuse me. Um, we also have a great reach into cancer, such as lung cancer and pleural malignancy, and then also chronic infections such as CF, bronchiectasis, and, and I've listed some of them there. And none of you would have been able to escape the fact that COVID-19 was a big respiratory illness and influenza will be in a second. Excuse me, one second. Next slide, please, thanks. So the other point I'd make about respiratory disease is, is that it presents in all its forms, early and late, in different healthcare settings. Of course, to the community, of course, to community pharmacies, primary care, having a cough as I have, for example, but then also to secondary and tertiary care environments, and then all the way up to intensive care. So pneumonia or respiratory infection, again, one of the commonest causes of sepsis to put you onto intensive care. So whenever you approach this disease area, I would beg you not to think of just COPD and asthma in the community. It's an extremely wide and diverse set of diseases. Next slide, thank you. 
Okay, I'm just summarizing here what SBRI says uh, are the strategic priorities, and I agree with all of them, and we'll perhaps dissect some of them bit by bit. So we want to detect and diagnose respiratory conditions earlier. I would certainly hugely support that. We do have some interventions that are well known to work in respiratory medicine, and it would be nice to be able to make sure that the right patients are receiving the correct medication. I think point number two is largely aimed towards correct use of inhalers, for example, which are very effective in the correct patients if they're used correctly. And there's two ifs there, as you can tell. The third is an important one, improve the response to pneumonia and relieve pressure on admissions. As I've stated, pneumonia is one of the commonest causes for an acute admission and relieving pressure at the front door is a priority. I'll come back to my thoughts on that. And then finally, improve exercise capacity and quality of life in respiratory patients. And this has been a very neglected area in research in general. We do have certain interventions that work, such as pulmonary rehabilitation. And a big part of the problem is equal or decent access for our patients in a timely fashion to a good quality pulmonary rehabilitation intervention. So uh, I think these things are complex. They're not just we lack evidence, but also uh, we lack the healthcare service delivery, which innovation may be able to help, help with. Next slide, please. Okay, the overall vision then for the life sciences uh, vision was to reduce the mortality and morbidity of respiratory disease. And the three areas that this document came up with were more effective treatment options for asthma. I'll come back to that. Innovation in the understanding and treatment of COPD. And I certainly would um, uh, agree with that. And then improve care pathways through improving diagnostic capacity and technology. And again, I think respiratory is really ripe for this exact area. Next slide. Now, um, before we get into some of the detail, I just wanted to give you my sort of frontline clinicians view of the big issues in respiratory medicine, where I would hope that the innovation would be focused. So our first big issue as respiratory physicians is that we diagnose people with this disease extremely late. So COPD is a good example. Very often by the time we see them in specialist clinics, they've lost 30, 50, 70% of their lung function. And there's lots that we can do to maintain them, but to wind the clock back is physiologically impossible. And therefore earlier diagnosis, diagnosis of at-risk triage of patients who are likely to go on to develop fixed airflow obstruction, this would be a big area for us. Asthma, I've put that there as well. Again, under treatment of asthma when patients are perhaps young between the ages of 12 and 25, may well lead to much worse um, longer term lung health. And indeed, asthma and COPD then kind of become the same disease with the same antecedent problems. And therefore, trying to get to these patients earlier, provide them with solutions that mean that the inflammation in the lung is well controlled and they do not go on to get the more severe end of the disease, I think is a priority. The other issue in both COPD and asthma is much more focused treatments, which I'll come back to later. And then because lung cancer is, is the largest cause of malignant mortality in the world, we shouldn't um, ignore this in respiratory medicine. Um, less than 20% of patients that we see have curable disease at the time of the presentation, and um, that you will fully be aware of the lung health checks um, and CT screening, which is coming. And I think there are a huge number of opportunities for innovative reach into early respiratory disease, early cancer, through established infrastructure, such as CT screening, which will come to the UK, I don't doubt, in the next five or 10 years. Um, next slide, thanks. My second big issue is that respiratory diagnosis and indeed management are not well joined up. So the vast majority of respiratory disease sits out there in primary care or in the community. The presentation is very generic, breathlessness, cough, lack of energy. And the majority of expertise or specialist assessments remain in secondary care. So lung function, CT, for example, respiratory expertise. And there should be a way of joining these things up. So at the moment, one of the problems we have in respiratory is non-specific treatment to everybody with non-specific symptoms, and then only referral when things haven't quite gone right. And what that leads to is wasteful treatment for a lot of people, unnecessary treatment for a proportion and delayed diagnosis for a proportion. Next slide, thanks. And that speaks to my third agenda, which is we simply don't target patients correctly. So at the minute, a patient who's breathless, who presents to primary care may well just be given an inhaler without specialist tests, with some degree of clinical acumen, but perhaps without 
the right degree of clinical acumen or the right tests. Try an inhaler, try steroids, et cetera, they become referred late. And that means that we overtreat or treat the wrong disease. And I think this is also an area where innovation may help us. Next slide. And then finally, if we come to the more acute end, such as pneumonia, acute respiratory infection, or acute respiratory failure, we do have effective treatments if we can diagnose these patients effectively early and then triage them to the right treatment early. And by that, I have several agendas. One of them is using our precious antibiotic resource in the right patients and aggressively, but the flip side is we shouldn't be using it for viral infections in whom we may not have an effective treatment, but we should think about the AMR agenda. So I would say pathogen-based diagnostics, point of care diagnostics for respiratory infections, for example, is a major area we should look into. Next slide. Okay, I'm just gonna, in fact, you put the next slide up as well, thanks, because it's um, two different points. So the first area in the challenge brief is early diagnosis. And I think there's no doubt that this is critical to help us improve outcomes in respiratory medicine. There's a lot of trend towards point of care early diagnostic tools, but in my estimation, the big issue with those studies to date have been they have not looked at improving clinical outcomes. And I would beg anybody doing a large study in this area, showing commissioners that it works, that you focus upon clinical outcomes that matter to patients and matter to clinicians and matter to the healthcare system. So it's all well and good having, ex having an expensive point of care test at the front door. The key question really is what difference does it make to patients, the healthcare system or healthcare professionals? Now, there are many, many potential innovative areas, including uh, new tech that might help us in this area. Home spirometry is a classic example, but again, I would urge you to try to focus on what is the outcome of home spirometry. It's all well and good measuring it. How does it translate to better care, more focused care or earlier care for your patient that results in a better outcome in general? I think a big area will be wearables, continuing, continuous home monitoring, it, and the golden ticket here is having patients with chronic respiratory disease in whom physiology, before they present with symptoms, can predict their exacerbation of their fibrotic lung disease or their COPD. If we could have innovative solutions that gave us these answers, this could transform how we treat these patients, keep them out of hospital, give them much more aggressive care at home. I've already mentioned diagnostics, and I think molecular diagnostics, pathogen-based um, especially in infection, would be absolutely um, a game changer in respiratory medicine. And then my own particular area which I'm interested in is bringing the respiratory expertise that is already present in some primary care uh, areas and a lot of secondary care, bringing that together with the community with innovative virtual and electronic solutions, virtual clinics, virtual wards, um, I think may be a really um, fertile area in respiratory medicine. Next slide, thanks. Second area is monitoring and management. So uh, there has of course been a large move towards saying, let's treat patients at home. It kind of worked in COVID for certain people. I think the key issue here is which treatment should go to which patient. And I do not believe that being at home in itself is a good outcome. I'm fully aware um, that ambulatory treatment in home hospitals are becoming very trendy. I think we should be very cautious about this. Um, my own view is that there are certain patients who absolutely need to be in hospital because they have extremely high care needs. The skill and where the innovation comes through is in selecting the correct patients for the home hospital and then making sure that the robust monitoring and escalation is in place in order to monitor that patient safely to demonstrate that they've got better or indeed to escalate back into in-hospital or ICU level care. And I think we need some data to support this. As I've stated here, I don't think just being at home is a good outcome. We need to think about the patient experience, the short and long-term outcome of their disease in terms of health, disability, and even mortality. Next slide, thanks. And uh, I would just say this, I think there is a big push towards let's telemonitor patients with chronic disease, let's do this, let's do the other. There have been lots of studies, randomized even, looking at asthma and COPD remote monitoring. And unfortunately, they have not shown shifting the needle in the outcomes that matter. What they in fact show is that people who measure their own saturations tend to consult with healthcare professionals more often and don't have any improvement in quality of life or other symptoms. So we need innovative solutions looking at what is really the need we're addressing as opposed to does the tech work? Uh, I think the tech probably works. The question is, what benefit could it have to our patients? Okay, next slide. I think I'm done there. 
Fine. So I'm uh, I'm very happy to um, take any questions and have an open discussion. Sally, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Marcia. It's a great overview on, on, on respiratory diseases, but also, you know, for, for putting into the, the broader context, explaining exactly you know, what we mean by by uh, respiratory, generally speaking, but also, um, you know, your, your insight on, on what are the current challenging, especially uh, experienced by the front line. So it, it's really good to, to hear that. Um, but some clear indication of what kind of innovations, uh, meaningful uh, innovations would, would actually make a difference. So, so that was really, really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, so now what I would like to do is, is to invite our, our, our speakers, uh, Brian and Natch, to, to come live. And we've got a few questions that came through um, the Q&A box. And, and, um, and I'm just sort of really aware of your time um, of, for participating to this session. So just wanted to sort of address some of these live, if that's OK with you. So if you, if you could come, that would be great. Um, and I will start perhaps with um, one for you, Natch, perhaps. Um, and, and I think you, you, you've covered that already quite well. But is the respiratory disease challenge um, around early diagnosis linked to monitoring and management, or are they separate from your point of view? Uh, that's a brilliant question. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that the answer to things is let's innovate new tech. I just don't think that's the thing. I think new tech has its place and is going to be important. But I would focus on the needs in respiratory medicine, not the needs of the tech. Um, so there's loads of tech out there. There's loads of wearables. Um, they've been variably successful in atrial fibrillation monitoring or COVID monitoring or not. But I think that's the dog wagging the tail or the tail wagging the dog, I should say, that way around. I, I, I think we need to think what are the needs of respiratory medicine in the UK? And look, any of you can go to any respiratory academic who's interested in COPD or ILD or whatever. And they will tell you, look, this is what we need. I have no doubt that innovative tech will meet that need, but the focus has to be clinical. If you want to convince commissioners to take your thing on board, they need to be convinced that it's doing something useful. Now, uh, I'm giving you a very biased view. In my view, useful is it makes the patient feel better or it decompresses the healthcare system. There are many other things in there as well. Quality of life, long-term health, long-term life. Um, but please try and maintain a clinical focus. I'm not sure if you agree with that, Brian. I've, I've given a particular view. I agree completely. I think that the, the focus has to be on something that's um, translatable and, and has a direct impact on health rather than the demonstration of the technology itself. So there's lots of things one can measure in cardiovascular disease that have no relevance to changing the trajectory of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or improving the outcome of patients. It's that challenge of framing the, the question in a way that has a direct clinical impact and then innovating a solution to solve that use case or that problem is the challenge for the innovation community. And to that end, I would strongly recommend applicants to have clinically trained people involved in order to sort of help you focus and frame those questions in a way that are directly relevant and useful to clinical doctors or to patients, uh, both in long-term prevention and in changing the trajectory of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or diseases, respiratory diseases as well, and other kinds of chronic diseases more generally, but also to sort of uh, managing not simply, not simply preventing disease, but treating those diseases. And I think that the, the real solutions, the real innovations will come from combining the revolution in data analytics with the revolution in their understanding of the biology of these chronic diseases with a deep clinical insight in order to frame the right question that the technology can solve rather than trying to develop a technology and retrofit fit that into some type of solution in the clinic, which never is going to be useful. So I, I would encourage innovative thinking as well as innovative products. Really interesting, yeah. Thank you, and and and, and I think you brought up the, the the sort of workforce pressure, and that's that's really interesting. And then at the beginning, you talked about health inequality, particularly around respiratory disease. I think it just really frames the different aspect that innovators need to consider. Yeah, and Tony, may I just come back? Something that Brian said just sparked off a thought, and I think it's an important one. I mean, to his point, there are things in respiratory that we've always measured that turn out not to be that useful. So, for example. The classic, classic is spirometry and asthma. The FDA and everybody else says any, any treatment that's going to shift the needle in asthma, it has to address spirometry. It turns out in the last five years that we've discovered that exacerbation frequency is a much more important outcome. So 
treatments that don't change your spirometry, they don't change that that is measurable, and yet they stop you having worsening requirements for steroids is much more important for long-term asthmatic health and speaks much more to the underlying biology. So treatments that change the spirometry don't change the biology, they just change the pipes, whereas treatments that reduce exacerbations are reducing inflammation, which is much more important. And I, I strongly advocate what Brian has said about engaging clinical experts in, in, in what you're planning, because then you'll be right at the edge of what's needed next within your sub area. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So the, the sort of key partnership to develop, that's really good. And um, perhaps we've got a question for, for you, Brian, actually around uh, sort of type two diabetes here. So would optimizing management of or reversing type 2 diabetes fit within the CVD prevention remit or, or theme uh, for this competition? I think it absolutely would for this reason. We know what causes atherosclerosis, which is the trapping of LDL and other agglobin containing level proteins within the artery wall. And as that process slowly grows over time, which is the rationale for early intervention, the plaque burden grows and the corresponding risk of events increases. But at any plaque burden, any superimposed injury to the artery wall caused by elevated blood pressure or smoking, or in this case, the dysglycemia of diabetes independently increases the risk of having an acute atherosclerotic cardiovascular event. And so it doesn't directly contribute to atherosclerosis. It certainly does contribute to um, the risk of having events or at any, at any uh, given level of plaque burden. And so this notion of not necessarily treating diabetes, but rather preventing diabetes really synergizes well with the notion of preserving cardiovascular or cardiometabolic health more generally. And I think that very much has a place involved. But I would also add that as you think about that, think about your solutions, this, one, of the no, one, of the, one of the specific challenges in the, in the at least the cardiovascular um, challenge was on explainable AI and explainable methods. It's extraordinarily important in order to sort of not give physicians black box solutions, because we're, we're sort of taught to reason from first principles about whether or not some symptoms could be attributed to a certain underlying biology. And so as you think about innovating, innovating your solutions, it's important for those to reflect the underlying biology of atherosclerosis or of diabetes or of hypertension or respiratory diseases in order for it to be intuitively understandable by the physician so that that, or healthcare provider, so that healthcare provider can then explain it to the patient or the citizen about what's motivating the recommendations and how much they're likely to benefit from it. So it's extraordinarily important to think broadly about preventing cardiovascular, cardiometabolic and respiratory diseases, but in a way that reflects the underlying biology and that people will find trustworthy because it makes sense biologically and intuitively. And I think that is a real challenge, which once again goes to the point of trying to include clinical doctors for that, to frame the right question. And perhaps the role of patients within you know, the, the, this piece of work. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Brian. Um, probably going back to you, Natch, now we've, we've got, I'm gonna put two questions into one to you. Um, first of all, um, there's the question around COVID and, and, and um, I'm just looking again at um, how it was framed, but how COVID is included as part of this respiratory disease category. Um, and there's another question around um, pediatric wheeze um, and how that sits in the expectation of, of value to okay. anyone. Thanks, um, Fanny. Let, let me take um, pediatric wheeze first. So pediatric wheeze is a hugely important problem. I'm not a pediatrician, but it's, um, it, it's the absolute bane of many GPs and many pediatricians because these kids come in and they're wheezing and it's just unclear what diagnosis they have. Should they be given long-term treatment? Do they end up having asthma? And we don't know much about assessment and management. And as you will imagine, doing complex lung function in these kids is impossible. It can't be done, especially when they're upset and they're wheezy. And uh, I just like to frame it in this way. If you're a parent and your kid wheezed and got a bit better, I think that's very frightening. And to sort of say, well, what does it mean for my kid? Are they asthmatic? Do they need an inhaler? Can they go swimming? We don't know any of these things. So pediatric wheeze, I think, is right in the middle of all of this, definitely. And solutions for better diagnostics, better assessments, more takeable assessments, including uh, innovative lung function, better monitoring. I would definitely put all of that absolutely in the middle of all of this. 
we do know that a certain proportion of these patients end up with very severe asthma and we'd like to catch them early. So pediatric wheeze is a big green tick from me. COVID's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, there's, uh, as you will all know, millions and millions of pounds have been spent on research in COVID-19 and quite rightly so. We're now in a position where we understand the acute treatment. We are beginning to understand antivirals in the community. So I'm part of the panoramic study that's looking into that. Um, we're starting to understand home monitoring, although there haven't been good quality studies as yet. So yes, I think COVID-19 assessments, innovative treatments, innovative monitoring solutions should be in the middle of this as well. COVID is not going anywhere, I am sorry to say. Um, there will be wave after wave, and the hope will be that the waves will diminish. But even if you innovate in the direction of COVID-19, I have no doubt that Australian flu will be here within three or four months and will do the same thing. So um, again, I would think broadly, it's not just um, a hospital disease. In fact, only 2% or so ends up in hospital, 98% is in the community and in community pharmacies. So I think there are ways and means of, yeah, I, I would put viral disease in there. That's great. Yeah, thank you very much. And I guess that the sort of long COVID came into discussion, I believe. Of, yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so sorry, Fanny, I didn't mention that. I think, I mean, lung COVID is, uh, that's a whole seminar in itself. Um, and, you know, what is it? How do we diagnose it? How do we treat triage patients with very broad symptoms? Um, do some of them have lung inflammation? Do some of them have vascular inflammation? It, this is a, a huge area which will continue to be a huge area, I think, for the next two or three or five years at the very least. So if somebody was innovating in the field of lung COVID, I would encourage that as well, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, really helpful. Um, I'm just aware of time because we still have got a few things to cover, and, and, and I know um, you know you've got you've got clinic to run as well, Nash. So yeah. um, I'm probably going to put a, a close to this Q and A session now, um, and we can always come back to some questions afterwards. Um, but I, I would really like to thank you both for, for your time and your insight on, on these particular challenges uh, for, for the SBRI healthcare competition. I'm really grateful for your time um, today and joining us for this session. So, so thank you very much for, for, for coming. It's my pleasure. Um, nice to see you. Bye now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Brian, as well. So, um, so now we're um, going to move on to um, our, our next speaker. And um, I'm going to welcome Z um, uh, from our program management office. Um, Z is a senior program manager in the innovations team um, in the SBRI Healthcare Program Management Office. Um, and, and Z will give you some information about the competition, um, the application process, uh, but also the program's assessment um, criteria um, and the different steps involved. Um, so I'm going to pass over to you now, um, Z. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Fanny. Um, so, first of all, good afternoon. And to everyone who's uh, able to join us online today to hear about SBRI Healthcare Phase 3 program. Can I have the next slide, please? So before I go into the specific process on how to apply and navigate through the application portal, I would just like to give a very brief overview of the competition timeline. So the application portal is already open and you have until 1 p.m. on the 26th of July to submit your application. Um, so following submission, each application will be assessed by our reviewers, which will include those with the challenge specific knowledge, but also those with commercial or implementation expertise as well. If shortlisted, applicants will have the uh, will be invited to an interview with the uh, with the panel currently scheduled for the 18th to 20th. Of, um, of, of October. And what we're aiming for is to announce the outcomes to successful applicants in November and then carry out the due diligence and the projects must then start in December itself. Uh, next, please. So um, applications will be assessed based on eight criteria, um, each of which has a different weighting attached to it. And these will include the things like evidence of your innovation itself, the project plan, competitive advantage and IP management, commercialization and adoption plan, consideration into public and patient involvement and engagement, the net zero agenda and EDI, which we heard um, throughout today already, the team composition and the cost justification. So all of these information will be uh, can be found on our website in the invitation to tender document. So please do, do go through this as you put together a proposal and take all of these weighting into consideration. Can I have the next slide, please? 
there are a, a number of resources available to help you complete the application. So please make use of all of them. So you provide all of the necessary information to help our reviewers assess the applications themselves. The FAQ is not yet online, but it will be uploaded later this week after the launch event today, so we can incorporate any further comments or questions into the document as well. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So to apply, you will need to submit your applications through our research management system, the RMS. If you have an account already, you can simply log in, but if not, you will need to register for an account. So please note the accounts will need to be manually approved by our admin team. And so you can only, and, and these can only be approved during the working hours between Monday and Friday. So please do get, get on with this and, and, and um, register for, for an account if you don't have one ready. Next, please. Once you've logged in, uh, please update your personal details using the Manage My Details tab on the left-hand side. These will be used to populate part of the application, so it is important that all of this are up to date. Once everything is updated, click My Applications again on the left-hand side, and you can then start a new application. Next, please. There may be more than one competition that's currently open or running. So please go browse through all of the available options to you. But the ones that we're talking about today is the funding round that is um, described as SBRI 21, phase three, respiratory disease and prevention of cardiovascular disease. Once you found it, just, kind of just um, select apply. Next, please. Once you are inside the application form, you will notice there are small question mark icons in blue circles throughout the form itself. These are prompts and suggestions for you to consider. The information should be used together with the additional information available in the guidance for applicants. You don't need to complete the form in one, set, in one sitting. You can save and close the application and come back at any time to complete it as well. Next, please. As you proceed through the form, you'll come to a particular section describing the teams, which will include team members, clinical partners, and also subcontractors and advisors. So the team members should really be the ones that are based in the same organization as the lead applicant, i.e. the lead organization. If you've got a collaborator from a different organization, you should really make use of the clinical partner or the subcontractor or advisor in sections instead. To add, add anyone into this section, whether it is a team member, clinical partner or advisor, they must first have an RMS account. If they don't, you will not be able to find and add them to your application. This is usually the section that would take the most amount of time and can be very time, time, time consuming to complete. So I would ask you to prompt your partners and collaborators to register as soon as possible to avoid any delays. And I just want to flag that any any um, delays caused by this uh, would not be acceptable um, uh, for, for us to consider to take this forward if you miss the deadline. Next, please. Once you have completed everything, and if you have added any team members or other um, collaborators, you will notice that the submit button is not immediately available to you. Can I go to the next slide, please? And this is because the people you added will need to log into their own account first and confirm their participation in the project. Once they have logged in, um, they can select my, uh, my co-applications on the left-hand side and click on the icon at the end of the application they have been included on. Next, please. They will then be taken to the next page where they can confirm their participation. Next, please. The lead applicant can track which one of the project participants have confirmed participation in the application summary page. Once everyone has confirmed the participation, you can go into the application one last time, check everything's okay, and after that, you should be able to submit. Can the last page, last um, slide, please? So that is just a very quick overview of the application process and the and the assessment criteria. Um, so I will now hand over to our next speaker. And if you have any questions um, following the launch event, please do get in touch with us. We've got our email address and phone number on here, and you can reach us on um, using either of those methods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Z. That was, that was a, a really good overview of how to apply um, and, and what are the um, assessment criteria for this competition. We can come back to any questions you've got for Z a little bit later, um, because now I would like to move on to our final speaker for, for today. Um, and I would like to introduce you to Dr. Des Holden. 
Um, so this is the CEO and also the medical director for the Kent, Surrey and Sussex AHSN, um, but is also the implementation lead of the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration. Des was a consultant and also the medical director at Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals NHS Trust. And then he joined Surrey and Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust um, as a medical director and member of the board uh, in 2011. Um, and he held this post until the 2019 when the CQC awarded the trust an outstanding rated overall um, and in four of the six inspection uh, domains. So Des is now chief of innovation at Surrey and Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust. Um, but he's also a non-exec director um, for the Southeast Health Technology Alliance, uh, so known as uh, CETA. Um, but he's also a visiting professor at the University of Surrey. So Des, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And I'll hand over to you now to discuss the network, uh, but also how you support innovations and end innovators. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, next slide, please. In fact, the one after next. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about academic health science networks. They've been around now for nine years and they're licensed by NHS England and the Office of Life Science to support transformation. So all of England is covered by NAHSN and I work down in the southeast there at Kent, Surrey and Sussex. But anyone who is based in England will have a local AHSN who could support them and should support them. Next slide, please. So AHSNs regard their purpose as transforming lives through innovation, and that should lead, well, when done well, to improving the lives of the public, driving economic growth through business success, and also ideally saving money by having a, a more efficient and more effective care pathway. Next slide, please. So we regard ourselves nationally as catalysts for change. And one of the things we do is connect people together. So with the advent of ICSs, we see that as connecting commissioners, deliverers of health and social care, be it physical health, mental health, or social care, third sector, academia, and industry with the public. And that element of with the public is important. Next slide, please. So although we behave as a network, a network, and although we have various nationally commissioned programs that are common to all 15, everything we do, we deliver locally. And although we have relationships at a national level, we have far more relationships locally with providers and recipients of care and academics. Next slide, please. So as 15, um, we're run by a very small central team um, into which we all contribute financially out of our central commission. Um, and through that team, we agree national priorities and we agree national programmes, whether that's with the Accelerated Access Collaborative or whether it's with other partners like NHSI or um, Office of Life Science. Next slide, please. So these slides are the slides we use as a network, and um, this one is a year or so old now. So during the second wave of COVID, AHSNs nationally supported oximetry at home. So people who had tested positive for COVID who were not sick enough to be admitted into acute care facilities could do their pulse oximetry at home and the prize was avoiding a silent hypoxia, which some people were presenting in COVID with, where they were essentially too ill to save. So this was a national program, which really was able to reach every CCG, every PCN across the country. And um, that middle graphic saying 489,000 patients have benefited from national programs. I think there's a bit of poetic license in that because what the HSN is very good at doing is counting process and it's a little less good at counting benefit. So the benefit is inferred rather than actually measured. And in our next license, we have agreed with NHS England that we will get far closer to being able to actually measure impact and benefit rather than counting process. The other figures on here are generally thought to be true and are accepted by NHS England. So 
AHSNs working in partnership with industry and with academics in particular have been able to leave a really large investment far greater than the cost of running AHSNs. And another metric that we have to report on is jobs created in industry and jobs protected. So some of the partnerships and spread of the products of industry that AHSNs have worked with have led to expansion of companies and greater employment. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. So for our national effort going forward, um, we have agreed programs in place in relation to mental health, in particular in relation to early intervention of eating disorders and for the earlier and more rapid diagnosis of ADHD. We have a national program in relation to lipid management, hypercholesterolemia and hypertension and its detection and management. And we have a variety of workforce programs and mandates from the AAC to deliver on rapid uptake products, all of which are nice supported and a medtech funding man mandate, which is um, for innovative technological um, changes to care pathways. In Kent, Surrey and Sussex, we lead on a product called Gamma Core, which is for cluster headaches and any national program through an RUP or through MedTech funding mandate will have an AHSN that leads on it. Uh, this year, in addition to these programs, we uh, will also have other programs in polypharmacy and also in chronic wound care. Next slide, please. Those are the kind of direct programs that we have, but all of our programs we also think of in a kind of cross-cutting way or through particular lenses. So we of course have an interest in digital technology and in AI, and I certainly wouldn't agree with Najib two speakers ago when he says that um, the place for remote monitoring and keeping people at home can only be justified if the outcomes for the public are enhanced over the, the standard model of care. We have an increasing view around diversity and inclusion and inequality. And one of the things that we feel um, is a potential risk around AHSN work is we may be bringing innovation to people who already navigate healthcare well. So this is such a kind of strongly held worry that we are now beginning to not just count how many people um, are reached by an innovation, but who are those people and who are the people that are not reached. And we're cutting that by um, all sorts of protected characteristics and also index of multiple deprivation. And I think because that's now where the AHSN network is focusing and because in our next license this will be explicit, and in all the work we do, including in relation to SBRI, we would want to see um, that kind of breadth of application uh, emphasised within uh, successful bids. Net zero is a big thing for the NHS, and we are expected to do our part in that as well. Um, one of the, the other things that Najib said was, as well as focusing on clinical outcomes, he strongly felt that need needed to be addressed rather than finding a home for solutions. So start with need. And the best way to do that is by discussing your idea and understanding the problem really at the front line of where care is delivered. So that's the interface between caregivers and those in receipt of care. Um, there are marks available in the process that Z just went through for um, how seriously patient and public involvement is taken within the, the bid that you're writing. And then we also look internationally. So as well as looking at what each HS, AHSN is doing, we also look at what is the best that's available internationally that may be of use in improving care in, uh, in England. Next slide, please. So about a third of our commission third of our money comes from the OLS. And it's very clear that what the OLS would like to gain is uh, economic growth 
at the same time as delivering better health outcomes. So we provide a service for any industry, uh, any business who comes and asks for help. Um, we, were, we are mandated to give an initial hour of conversation about the problems that particular company or product is facing and how they may be helped. And then above that, there are various other offers that we can give with more time and with partnerships. Um, and that is all laid down and can be accessed through uh, the HSN ne network website. Um, but one of the things in practice that we do is we're able to interface between industry and innovation and the people for whom it's intended to benefit. So clinicians, um, purchasers, with, particularly in the acute sector, um, but increasingly that will be with ICSs um, and also with the public themselves. Next slide, please. So in the year of this slide in 2021, um, AHSNs up and down the country interacted with almost 5,000 companies um, and that resulted in nearly 3,000 of them being supported in one way or another. Now that may have been quite small or it may have been through the SBRI process or through other bids or in combination with researchers. Um, or directly to be able to get their product placed into pathways. Um, and some of the other numbers there I've already referred to on a previous slide. Next slide, please. So increasingly, um, the need to know what each AHSN is doing has driven the creation of a pipeline. So every AHSN puts the things that it's aware of onto a pipeline that's visible across the network. And what this means is that if a solution is of proven value in the Midlands or in the North, then people within my HSN in Kent, Surrey and Sussex can see that and they can draw on that for challenges that individual ICSs are facing. So when I make an offer to one of our three ICSs in Kent, Surrey and Sussex, I'm saying we can support you to recognize and develop your own innovators, to manage and permit those innovators within networks, but we can also horizon scan to see what else is being put onto the pipeline that may have a value in the challenge that you're facing. Um, so this is an, an increasingly important function of the network to behave as a network, even though working locally. Next slide, please. So as Najib said, um, start with need. So really try to understand what it is that your solution is going to address, because the more granular you describe, you, you understand the need that caregivers and care recipients are experiencing, the better are you able to tailor what you have to that challenge. So an innovation exchange, which we all use, is a, a four component um, process, which starts with need, then showcases that need to partners, be they industry or academic or care providers. When that technology or solution is placed to evaluate it is the third step and where the evaluation is positive and outcomes and impact are improved then spread and spread moves into adoption when that um, new pathway is maintained. So that's how we work. Um, that's done most effectively by both pushing and pulling. So we can push solutions towards the system, but through using our networks for telling them what we're working on, for building consortia around certain problems, we can also create pull and the pull is vital to um, the least effort spread of innovation. Um, it, it's a lot more efficient having your offering pulled than it is trying to push it towards someone. Next slide, please. All AHSNs support the NHS Innovation Accelerator, which is run out of UCLP. And every year around about 15 to 20 people are selected to go on to the program. Some of you may have been on the program, some of you may be thinking about it. 
you get on the program by being credible as an individual with a good innovation uh, and with PPI evidence and support. So again, we're back to PPI being extremely important. Um, there's a lot of support given to fellows on the NIA, but that support is available outside the NIA as well. And many AHSNs feel they work just as well with people outside the NIA as they do with people within it. And there are many success stories up and down the country of working with people through the SBRI process and others that have really seen growth and impact for the public. Next slide, please. So that was all I was going to say, but um, I think there may be a bit of time for questions and I'm very happy to try to answer them. Yes, thank you very much, Des. That was um, a really good overview of the HSN and I hope everybody found it really useful uh, and insightful on, on how to work with you and then the support um, you can provide, but also tips for innovators, generally speaking. Um, so yeah, that was really good to, to, to hear from that, from, you, uh, from that point of view. Thank you. Um, now I would like to invite um, um, Desi, Amy and, and, and Mike as well um, back for our final um, Q&A session. Um, and, and I've got a few questions perhaps for, for, for you um, coming through. So if you've got any questions for Z, um, Des or, or, or Mike, um, please pop them into, into the Q&A. Uh, we've got a short period of time to, to go through those. Mm -hmm. um, th there's, a, there's a question that came up around C marking um, and, and uh, particularly around the entry criteria for this phase three competition. Um, and for companies, um, so the, perhaps a twofold, one is around UKCA and the deadline of, of January 2023. Um, and another one for companies that are not yet C marked, uh, what would be an additional requirement to be eligible? Uh, would having performed successful pre compliance testing make us eligible uh, for the program? Um, they're, they're saying that their hardware and software platform is 95% um, ready. I don't know if there's any comments around. You know, see marking and entry entry point for, for the program. I don't think you have to be C marked. You have to be on a trajectory to get your C mark. I think that's in the spec on the, that twelve page spec document. Um, and also, the, there's a question as well about UKCA marking. You have to be on a you have to have a plan in place by first of January twenty three to get C mark. Recognizing that CA mark won't come into effect until June twenty three. So answering George's question by yourself, um, if you can show that you're on trajectory or you're adopted into a hospital, I think you're on the right path. So George, just apply. Yep, just, just clear milestones perhaps of, of yeah. what the expectations are. Yeah. Um, perfect, thank you very much, Mike. We, we've got another question on, on um, the nature of, of evidence. Perhaps that's something you might be able to, to help and, and answer. Would you be able to elaborate on the nature of the evidence you would expect to be collected and analysed in a 12-month project? And, and for example, um, is an RCT something expected as part of this programme? Is that one for me? Yes, perhaps um, one for you, yeah. Sure. So both as a marker and then as on the panel, I think what we're looking for is convincing evidence of the value of the proposition um, and then a route towards being able to spread it and evidence is important in both of those aspects so for phase three you're saying we've already done a study within um, one system we've joined those partners up successfully and we've been able to demonstrate a value to the product we're now looking to spread it more widely so you're looking for evidence that it's genuinely outcomes. You're looking really for evidence of who it is has been reached. And in the new proposal, do the population look the same or do they look markedly different? And how is that being engineered in? So um, it would be difficult to write a list of exactly what the evidence is, but it's that it gives you a, a reproducible, realistic story of the benefit to the public or to workforce of, in, of instituting this innovation. An RCT is a subset of the proof, really. Uh, it's just one of the ways you could go. You could produce a health economic assessment. You could do adaptability, show how it fits into the clinical pathways. How it, so you can look at lots of things. RCT is just one tool. 
Yeah, perfect. That's really helpful. Thank you very much, Des and, and Mike. Um, we've got um, a, a question around risk and what sort of um, risk we, we're looking for. Um, because um, so we've got uh, uh, somebody in the audience saying that, that most of the risk should have been overcome during the R&D of the product. Mm -hmm. um, that does enable the, 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 the required C or UKCM mark um, that is being tested. So what kind of level of risk are we discussing? Might perhaps that's something you, you, you could come in for? Yeah, uh, I saw this question. Yeah, I can understand the technical risk has been overcome and that, that might be part of the risk, but there's also a risk of adoption. How does it fit in? If it takes 15 times as long to do this thing as it takes normally, then, then it's going to be too much it's not going to fit in. So there is some level of risk. Even when you go through therapeutics and you're doing phase three clinical studies, it's about a 50-50 chance your phase three is not going to work when you put it into real world hands. So um, there is still a degree of adoption risk, scale risk, and fitting into existing practice risk. So I, I can understand the technical risks overcome, but there is still quite a lot of risk out there in terms of adoption. Otherwise, we'd see everything that's been produced and works adopted everywhere. Yeah. Absolutely. There's still a, a lot of technology that fall at that stage. So yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Um, we've got a question from, from Susan around, um, so Susan is saying that um, you've got an Innovate UK funded trial that is starting in September, um, but also wish to conduct smaller studies in other patient cohorts, um, and whether that would be deemed as, as eligible. I don't know if this is something that you would be able to come in in terms of eligibility criteria. Yeah, um, I, I can I can try to provide some uh, some context about this. So if I mean, obviously, we, you can come in, provided that your innovation and project itself meets the eligibility degree and entry criteria, some of which have already been discussed by Mike and Des. Um, is that in principle you can come in? Obviously, you know, we can't, we won't be funding anything that Innovate UK has already funded, but if you're using that as a platform. For you to conduct further studies in terms particular implementation or building the additional evidence that would support you in in uh, in getting a product being adopted or, or spread then that is fine because you're building on something that you currently have um, already um, but what obviously what you have to emphasize in the application is um what whether there, there will be any overlap and what kind of resources will you be um uh, what will, have, will you have for the Innovate UK grant and also what you'll be building on top of that um, and I think it's quite essential to actually specify um, what's the added value for you to conduct these or, or, or to investigate these additional areas that are not covered in the, in, the, in the UK award in order to proceed to the next step of the commercialization or ado adoption of the technology. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Z. Um, I'm just aware of time. I know we've got a, a, a few more questions in, in, in the Q&A, um, but I think it's probably time that you draw close to, to this session. Um, and we'll respond to any other questions in our frequently asked questions that we will be publishing on our website soon. Um, so, we, so we can follow up on that. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to make sure uh, we mentioned is that we will have a question and answer drop-in clinic um, scheduled on Thursday, the 30th of June at half past two. Um, and that's an opportunity to have a one to one um, uh, discussion and session with the SDRI Healthcare Program Management Office. Um, so please keep that in mind Thursday, the 30th of June at half past two, and we'll put that on, on our website for you to be able to register. Um, so just a quick recap that our competition is now open um, and will close on the 26th of July. Um, so please do join our drop-in clinics or contact us um, if you've got any specific questions on, on um, through the inbox. Um, now I would like to, to uh, thank our speakers today uh, for, for joining us and, and providing insightful um, um, vision and, and uh, overview of, of the challenges in this competition and particularly would like to thank uh, Mike Nadj Brian and Des for, for joining us today, taking time away from busy schedules and con contributing to the session um, and contributing as well to, to developing this competition. We, we're really grateful for, for the insightful um, discussion we've had, um, but also for, for your time at the launch event today. A special thank you as well to, to the SBRI Healthcare Program Management Office for, for preparing the funding competition uh, and for this session today. Uh, and thank you to everyone here today joining the session and, and attending this webinar. We hope you find it useful and um, it was good to hear about the challenge and, and the competition. And we look forward to hearing more from, from you soon. 
will that be closing this session. Um, so I wish you all the best of luck with your application process and thank you again for, for your time today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for, for, for joining. See you very soon. Bye.